Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up from the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up from the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord.
The second reading is from a letter of Paul to the Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you life to the mortal bodies also the, through the spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the living God, who loves us unconditionally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, and this is especially evident in the Gospel of Matthew, which we're following during these weeks of the summer, he tells lots of stories about common things. He uses stories and illustrations and examples from the everyday life of the people in that time and in that place. Uh, he lived in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, so uh, there was a, a lot of, of references or settings uh, to water and to the lake and to fresh water. Uh, he talked about farming. Uh, he talked about the lady who, you know, loses a coin or someone who's looking for treasure and on and on, just the everyday facts and fantasies 
of life in, in that early part of the first century. At the end of these stories, and he was very fond of, of, of sharing parables, these are stories with meaning and morals, and yet often they were not obvious. Sometimes they were. But at the end of these stories, he would frequently either exaggerate the point or he would leave the people hanging so that they sort of could think about it and draw their own conclusions and probably a long time after he told it and they'd been thinking about it, there was actually a surprise lesson in there somewhere as well. Some of the parables uh, he explained because their meaning or how he told the story was a bit more complicated and so you have examples of him explaining to the disciples what the meaning and the moral uh, of the story was. Today, he tells the story of a farmer, a gardener, someone uh, planting seeds. And as he tells this story, uh, he gives examples of different kinds of soil and what happens to seeds when they're planted. It was something that virtually everyone who heard him that day could relate uh, to that particular example. But in today's gospel lesson, uh, I think he leaves us perhaps with this underlying question, we who live in the 21st century. And that is spiritually and in other ways as well, why is it that some Christians' lives are so enormously productive in different ways and others are not. And that is part of what Jesus is addressing in this parable. He suggests that some people are just hard, like hard, rocky ground. He says on that soil, you know, the birds come along because the seeds are just laying there and, and take them away. Certainly because the soil is hard, uh, it doesn't grow there. It doesn't put down roots. So he, he seems to suggest that concerning what he's talking about, that some people just aren't going to produce when they hear the gospel and the teachings of Christ and of God, that some people are just hard. Maybe hard in the sense of having closed minds, maybe hard hearts. Perhaps people that would act this way, whether or not they stated it, and sometimes they might state it, that, ah, Christ, it's a waste of time. I'm not religious. I don't believe. Church, it's a waste of time, and, and on and on and on. Then he goes on to say that some people are like rocky soil. I think in our modern day, and, and, and his, his illustration bears this out, people on rocky soil are people that buy into the illusion that if you are a Christian, you will automatically have a better family. That if you follow Christ, you'll get a better job. You'll have better children. Life will just be successful, humanly speaking, because you're a Christian. And uh, some churches actually teach this. Now, we believe that God blesses us, and we certainly believe in asking God to bless us and guide us, and it happens. But in the Christian life, there are no guarantees that if you're a Christian that nothing bad's going to happen to you, and there's no guarantee that everything you try is going to succeed. But there are people who want to believe this, and they're like this rocky soil uh, Jesus talks about. This kind of Christianity often leads to what we might call quickie Christians. You've seen quickie Christians. You know, these are folks that when things are really, really going bad, they go to church. And often they come to church looking for a quickie solution to whatever is going on in their life. Now, keep in mind, I am grateful whenever anyone comes to church for whatever reason they come to church, and they might even come. I know I've seen this in, in my early, early adult years. I lived this, <clears throat> excuse me, and that is you come to church because you're in trouble, but something happens and you end up putting down roots, and God speaks to you, and it becomes a life-changing event, but you showed up for a quickie solution to a problem. That's one type of soil or people that Jesus talks about. 
The third kind of soil that Jesus talked about is very interesting. That one that was filled with weeds. This is where the cares or the riches or the pleasures of life choke out true faith. And we know that this happens. And if you're like me, there have been times in my life, perhaps when I allowed it to happen somewhat. It, it, it's something it's easy to fall into, this kind of soul that gets distracted by the cares or the pleasures of life. For example, for the poor, this kind of soul illustrates the person that, that simply having enough or not having enough tends to choke out true faith. For the rich, it can be just the opposite. Having all they need and even more and not having any real needs that they're aware of can, can choke out faith. And we, we develop a very unhealthy independence from God in our lives. For most of us, perhaps who are not super poor but not super rich, perhaps for everyone else like that, what chokes out our faith is not not having enough or not having too much, but simply wanting more than we have. And that wanting more can choke out our faith. I think for every human being, as we look at this parable that Jesus tells about how we respond in life to God in our world and in our lives, that worry can be a choking factor for all of us. Because it doesn't matter how rich or poor we are, or what our station is in life, what our race or creed is, what our educational level is, all the things that, that make humans different from one another, that worry can be that common denominator that in our life can be a huge distraction and choke out the, the new life in Christ that is so freely offered to us. And of course, finally, Jesus has the example of the good soil person. This is the person that hears the word, he says, responds to that word, and becomes so, so fruitful and productive that, that, that the word of God, the will of God, blossoms in their life 30, 60, sometimes 100 times. You see, I believe what Jesus is driving at here is that this is the person that before cares and worries, before riches, before pleasures, this person puts God first in their life. They give God the first and best of their time. They give God the first and the best of their money and their other resources, and the first and the best of their energy. These are the people that their faith becomes part of their daily walk. They're not super Christians. They're not spiritual giants. But somehow or another, the word of God and the will of God has taken center place in their life. And they still do all the other things. But the backdrop is this devotion, reliance, and trust in God, God's self. And when this happens, everything else has a way of falling into place. And Jesus teaches this over and over, that if we seek first, for example, the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, that everything else we need somehow will be given to us. It will show up. You see, like happiness, a purposeful life is a byproduct, a byproduct of putting faith first, a byproduct of living uh, a spiritual life of perpetual gratitude. This is a life that is a byproduct of having our priorities straight and in order. And there is a very simple but profound truth here in this gospel. And that is, in order to have this kind of spiritual and human productivity, we have to do some planting. This is July in Georgia. If you want to pick peaches, at some point, someone has to plant the trees. Over and over, I talk with people who say, 
you know, I wish I had more faith, or I wish I were a better Christian, and I'm always respectful and, and, and moved and touched by those kinds of sentiments. Sometimes they say, I wish I, I were more loving and faithful like this person or that person. But here's the truth, my friends. You have all the potential you need I begin my homilies each week with those words in the name of the living God who loves you unconditionally because I truly believe that and it is part of the bedrock of our gospel. God loves you unconditionally. There is nothing that you can say or do or think that will make God stop loving you. And you have all the potential you need to follow Christ. We do not need giant faith. All we need to do is to live the faith we have, and it will become giant faith. In our other scripture lessons that we read this morning, this is the abundance of living that Isaiah talks about. And this is also the, the walking with the Spirit that Paul writes to the Christians in the city of Rome our colleague today, that we began this time of worship together with, I think says it well and expresses what should be the sentiments of our hearts, where we prayed, O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world. For Donald, our president, Brian, our governor, and our soldiers, Hunt, Jared, Chris, Mary Owen, Jeff, Justin, Ryan, and Holden. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Rob, Paul, and Don, our bishops, Wesley, our priest, and Derek, our seminarian, for all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, remembering especially Anne, Amanda, Doug, Mary, Philip, Sonny, Marge, Deb, Annika, Carolyn, Marcia, Christopher, Brooke, James, Karsten, Drew, Mimi, David, Chris, John, Rosemary, Virgil, Craig, Nancy, Jill, Beth, Rich, Jesse, Elizabeth, Iola, Jane, Angela, Pat, Hollis, Lauren, Judy, Francine, Lee, Luane, Karen, Rick, Ben, Megan, Kinsey, and Arthur. 
Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially those celebrating birthdays this week. Camilla, Stuart, Kay, Mary Catherine, and Eden. And for those celebrating anniversaries, especially Beth and Tony. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, especially Mary Jane Bartholomew, who died last week, and Gary Gregory, in whose honors our flowers are given, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has promised forgiveness of sins to all them who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray together. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our human ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is with you this day and will remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>